Giving Tuesday events. <coughs> welcome to everyone here. Thanks for being here. Thanks for taking the time. And, thank, and welcome to everyone that's on live streaming as well. Uh, thanks for joining us on, on live streaming. Uh, this is actually, I'm told, the first meeting that we've used the technology in this room. So enjoy the uh, visual and auditory feast. Um, and forgive any bumps in the road because we're all just learning it and uh, trying out new stuff. So uh, this is pretty exciting. Um, Great to have you here. That music you were just listening to 
that was uh, one of the projects in the gift catalog. That's Every Kid Jam from Montreal City Mission. So that's a beautiful, we thought we'd start with that and, and, a, and a group of photos. So today's one of the ways the United Church responds to Giving Tuesday. So what's Giving Tuesday? Well, it started actually in 2012 in the U.S. And it started as a response to the uh, material feeding frenzy that followed U.S. Thanksgiving, uh, so-called Black Friday, and so-called Cyber Monday. A group of activists thought we should push back a little and have a Giving Tuesday and celebrate generosity and giving and what the spirit of giving is about. So we've been celebrating in the church for a few years now. Last year was the first year we associated it with the gift catalog. So why the gift catalog? Well, the gift catalog is a way of supporting our mission and service partners through direct gifts, direct line of sight gifts. And it's a gift that gives in multiple ways. People who are planning on giving gifts to friends anyway, they have an opportunity to give something very meaningful, very impactful, very useful, and very caring for people in our mission service ministries across Canada and around the world. For the gift recipients, it's a gift that doesn't have to go in the sock drawer or with the ties or a sweater that only gets worn once. It's actually a gift that they know is making a real difference. And most importantly, for the people that are helped and served by our partners across Canada and around the world, it's a meaningful gift that changes lives, that makes their lives better, that makes a real difference. So it's a multiple gift, one that requires no wrapping. So uh, today is both the launch of our in-house mission service campaign. Emails went out yesterday and today for the launch of that. And that's a chance for each of us to think about our gift for the next year and what gift we want to make if we're on payroll deduction, how we want to support. Um, and it's also a chance for us to give a gift, immediate gift, today on Giving Tuesday. So we're going to hear from just two examples of the mission and service ministries that are in the gift catalog and also, of course, in mission service. We're going to hear from Matt Why Not. He's the executive director of Sherbrooke Lake Camp. And then we're going to hear from Reverend Evan Smith, who heads up Toronto Urban Native Ministries. And we're going to, then we're going to wrap up fairly quickly, and we've got treats at the back. I want to thank uh, uh, Deo and Samantha, Ruth, and Kathy for organizing all of this. That's awesome. We're off to a great start. So today, when you're done and you head back to your desk, please take the time to look at the gift catalog and make a gift today. We track the gifts that are made today and for a few tomorrow, um, and it's something that we want to track and see how much of an impact are we having with this. So let's hear from our moderator next. Um, she wanted to be in on this, even though she's traveling today. She wanted to be a part of this. So let's hear from our moderator next, and then Ruth will join us. tell you that one of the privileges I have as moderator is that I get to travel across the country visiting with congregations and ministries in our church who are doing amazing work. One of the places I recently visited in Newfoundland Labrador Conference was the Jimmy Pratt Memorial Outreach and I was so inspired by what I saw there. And then they told me how excited they were that they were in the Gifts with Vision catalog last year and what a difference those contributions made to their ministry. And that has inspired me once again for November 28th, Giving Tuesday, to make a gift with vision because I know that together we are making a real difference in the lives of people across Canada and around the world. So thank you for giving and please continue the good work we are doing. Coordinator. Um, so, 
I'm going to talk about uh, the send a kid send a kid to camp uh, gift, and um, I'm going to show you tell you a story about this man. This is Sean, and Sean was a youth in one of my congregations, and Sean was um, he was struggling and he was feeling lost, and uh, his parents were worried that he was heading down a bad path. And so they sent Sean to Camp Bikinu, which is one of our United Church camps. And um, there's all kinds of postcards over there on the, the soundboard credenza of all kids and how their impacts with camp. But Sean um, went to camp, and he came back a transformed youth. Then he became a leader in training, and then he became a camp director, and he met his wife at camp, and now they have two beautiful little girls, and that's the second one there with him, that's June, um, and he's a, a public school teacher. He teaches grade six in London, Ontario, and he will tell you that it's because of camp that he is where he is today. Um, and so that's just one of the stories of how people are transformed with camp. So we're gonna have um, Matt on Skype now. Is Matt there? <coughs> Hey everybody, how are you? Good, how are you doing today? <coughs> not too bad, not too bad. Thanks so much for joining us via Skype. Um, no I will tell you, all I can see is ceiling. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we just did this to things. Um, so, uh, where are you today? I am at Hope United Church in Halifax. I'm the Congregational Designated Minister here for Children, Youth, and Families. So I'm in my... Um, in my office, but there's also uh, is a, um, as you probably can see, a storage facility as well. So. <laughs> so we wanted to talk to you today about your camp, and while you enjoy your coffee, um, um, what is your role with camp, and which camp? Yeah, so I'm uh, the executive director at Sherbrooke Lake, uh, Sherbrooke Lake Camp, uh, which is in Franny Corner, Nova Scotia. So if you know, um, if you know Nova Scotia at all, it's sort of inland from uh, Lunenburg, Mahon Bay area. Oh, lovely. Okay. So how did you get into camping? Yeah, it was kind of a weird, uh, a weird thing. You know, you sort of your your parents, your, particularly my mom, who was a single single mom, she sort of forced me to go to camp at uh, at a young age. I actually started at uh, Camp Kidston. Um, as a camper, um, and my church uh, sponsored me to go to camp. Loved it, loved every minute, wanted to go back for a second week, but as a second, as a, a single parent, mom didn't have the resources to do that. So unfortunately, I didn't get to go back to camp uh, for two or three weeks in the summer. And uh, there was an opportunity that came forward to, to be a counselor in training at 15 in 1999, and mom said, you should go to this other camp. Don't know anything about it, just try it out. And here I am, you know, 17 years, 18 years later, as the executive director. So I play every role from counselor training to counselor to rec director to board member to chair of the board now to executive director. Wow, wow, wow. that's a lot of roles. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so there is the I Am Camp campaign. I'm sure you're familiar with it, and we have some stats about that. And I just wanted to. Share those, and then you can tell us what you think about these, and maybe there's a story that is sparked when I say these different categories. So what campers have said about United Church Camping is that 32% love friendship and community. There's the all program activities. They love everything about camp. Learning about creator and creation, singing and campfire, the counselors and the staff, that's an important one. Camp food is always important. Uh, acceptance and personal growth and cabin time. So mm -hmm. do any of those spark anything for you? That's a day at camp. Um, <laughs> I'll, 
they, um, you know, I, I have this rule, uh, a couple of rules. One of the rules that I have is if we send kids home after a week at camp with a full belly, with a smile on their face, um, they learn something that they can take away, whether that's spiritual or, it's, or, uh, or you know, learning how to canoe or light a fire or something like that. Um, and they're asleep by the time they hit the end of the camp road. Um, we've done our job. <laughs> and I, you know, camp is one of those things. You know, I, I, um, I just came back from a conference in the States around camping, and um, we, saw, uh, one of the speakers um, in, in, the, in, in the States who was, at, who was at the conference said, you know, why does camp actually work? That was a question that she asked us all camp people. And we, you know, and, and for me, camp works because it's, uh, it, it, there's, a, there's a sense of peace. Um, um, in the world that we live in today, you know, these ki kids are doing this all the time. Um, they're not connecting with each other. Um, they're, um, you know, it's just easier to send a nasty text to somebody or, or, or make a comment on social media. Um, rather than bring up, you know, something that might be conflicting, bring it up to their face. Um, so camp allows everybody to be a little bit vulnerable because it takes them out of their comfort zone of home and of technology, puts them in, in, in the woods with a group of people who are all at the same level as they are. Um, so it, it takes those kids outside of what they know it allows them to uh, feel connected to um, the spirituality, um, to something that they may not have ever experienced before. And um, it's, it's a magical and wonderful thing that we have in our church, 14,000 children, 14,000 children coming to our United Church camps across this country. Um, 1,200 youth. Who are being employed by our camps, a thousand volunteers on our boards and on our on our committees. Um, but here's the thing: this is what really surprises me. Now, I don't think we actually attract this, but I can tell you that at our particular camp at Sherbrooke Lake, I'm of the 416 kids that we had last summer. I can tell you that 70% of those kids do not affiliate themselves with the United Church of Canada. So when we talk about that scary E word that many of us don't like, many of folks in the churches may not like to use, we are, we are, we are the, the um, huge mechanism to do evangelism in our church. And to be able to tell our story of acceptance and of love, it's, that's, that's why I do my job. serving at Toronto Urban Native Ministries since May of 2014. She uses her own experience, her life experience, as an Anishinaabe two-spirit person, her passion for evangelism and discipleship, and to minister with some of the most vulnerable people in Regent Park and the larger Toronto community. She's a partner, a mom, a grandma, I don't believe that far. Um, she spends her spare time swimming, camping, dancing, and lifting stuff at the gym, and uh, also serves on the uh, United Church of Canada Foundation board. So delighted to have you with us, and please join us. I 
Anin, Noden Indigenous Cosmology, K. Dodo, Manishnabe, Nish, Mandog, and Dow, Toronto, and Indian Chabad. Good morning. Uh, I'd like to, first of all, uh, thank you all for being here this morning. I'd like to thank Gifts with Vision for uh, choosing Damish Goziman as one of their gifts this year. I'd like to start by talking a bit about the history of the 60s scoop. I think that's something that is just sort of now coming into a lot of attention with media. Um, and I think for those of us who work in the church, it really continues on from the legacy of residential schools. So residential schools operated from 1876 until 1996. But in the 1950s, there was a change made uh, to the Indian Act in 1951, which then left the welfare of indigenous children under the jurisdiction of the province. And so by the 1950s and the 1960s, the Canadian government was closing residential schools because they were seen as destruct destructive, as not efficient, and most of all, they were costly. Yet the government still thought that assimilation was the best answer for Indigenous children. And so what ended up happening was that instead of being placed in residential schools, children were taken out of their communities and they were placed into foster homes and adopted by the majority non-Indigenous families. And so the government did this because it seemed more cost efficient than to actually put money into communities to improve the situations of children that were living on reserve. What I didn't know when I started this work was the number of children that were adopted outside of Canada. In 1981, it was revealed that over 55% of children scooped from their communities were adopted into the United States. <clears throat> through this work, I've met children who were adopted through the United States and all the way in England and New Zealand and Australia. And so when I think about the trouble reintegrating into our communities here in Canada, I can't imagine what it would be like if I had been sent overseas. In 1981, there was another change made, and that change was that that was the first time that child welfare agencies had to notify the bands and the communities that children had been removed from their community. So up until 1981, if a child was removed from the community, the band didn't even necessarily know. Children were apprehended sometimes out of hospitals when mothers were sent to urban centers to give birth, out of TB sanatoriums. And so the real numbers of how many children were removed are something that we're still struggling with. And so in my ministry, Toronto Urban Native Ministry, we've been around for 21 years. And for a long time, I ran the healing circle for the Indian residential school survivors. And that circle ran out of council fire and was led mostly by Andrew Wesley. And when I started working in my ministry, Andrew took me to hear the stories of the residential school survivors. And as we left the room one day, he said, this is really important, but this isn't your story. Something needs to be done with adoptees in Toronto. And I thought to myself, surely there's work being done. There's so many of us. But what I found out was that there was no healing program in the city of Toronto for, resident, or for 60 scoop survivors and indigenous adoptees. So three years ago, I started Damish Cozy Men, which in Anishinaabe Moan means we are strong. And we started as a healing circle. We met at Bloor Street United Church and now have started meeting at Council Fire Native Cultural Center. We have up to 40 participants each month. And we started by getting together and we pass around the eagle feather. And the eagle feather for us is one of the most sacred items because we believe that the eagle is the one who, flows, who flies closest to the creator and hears our prayers and takes them to creator. And so we pass around the eagle feather and everybody gets an opportunity to talk about their story, share their pain, share their triumphs. And it was really difficult because it was difficult to hear that unlike myself, and I was adopted into a really good family, uh, a lot of people were adopted into families that turned out to be quite abusive, uh, where their cultures were completely erased. <coughs> and so these stories were really painful. And I spoke to Michael Chena, who's the elder for our circle, and Pamela Carter, who is the traditional knowledge keeper that works with us, 
And we talked about how we actually needed to move past the stories and start to do some healing. And for a long time, we supported members of the Ontario class action lawsuit. So a lawsuit was launched in 2009 by Chief Marcia Brown Martel, and it was to get liability costs for the pain and loss of culture that was experienced by Indigenous children in Ontario. Lawsuits were being launched all across Canada, and they fought for a long time. And eventually, there was a Canada-wide settlement made this October. And what was really disappointing with that Canada-wide settlement was that for the majority of the people who attend our healing circle, myself included, we aren't eligible. Because it was only people with status, who were seen as status Indians under the Indian Act, as well as Inuit uh, community members who were included. So for myself as a non-status person, for my brothers and sisters who are Métis, and my brothers and sisters who were adopted overseas uh, and into the States, it doesn't count them. And so for me, that sort of reignited my resolve for this circle because I realized that just like we couldn't rely on the government to keep our children safe through residential schools and through the 60s, 70s, 80s and continuing, we still can't rely on them to also support our healing. And healing is such an important part of our journey. What we've done with the Healing Circle is that as we meet monthly, we've started to listen to the needs of the community and really integrate uh, what those are. And a lot of what comes up is the need for reconnection with language, with ceremonies. So many of us were raised outside of our communities, outside of our families, and we don't have those connections. And so we've never learned our language. We don't know our ceremonies. For many of us, when we learn our ceremonies, it can be quite painful because so many of them start when we're children. There's rite of passage ceremonies throughout our entire journey, and we don't have access to those. And so part of what we've done with Amish Cozy Men is to access elders and healers in the community who are willing to sit with us, to answer our questions, to meet us where we're at, to be non-judgmental, and to be able to engage in the healing work because for many of us, we feel out of place in the indigenous community, like we're not indigenous enough and that's a really difficult place to start from. And so in our circle, we've had a pipe ceremony for 60 scoop adoptees. We've done language lessons. We, have, we are working on getting together uh, crafting sessions to do things like uh, feather bundles, to do drum teachings. And these are really important pieces because one thing that has started coming up as we're three years into this healing journey is that children are still being apprehended from our communities. Right now in Saskatchewan and Manitoba, upwards of 80% of children in care are indigenous. And so we're recognizing that we have to move forward and quickly on our own healing journeys because there's children who need us. Who need us to be strong, to stand up, to be able to say enough is enough, to help stop the apprehensions and support parents and community members to be able to parent the best that they can so that our children stay in our communities and in our cultures. And so by supporting Gifts with Vision and our healing circle, we're able to provide some of the basic things like tokens and food because a lot of people coming to our circles live in deep poverty or are homeless or street involved and even getting downtown to the circle is difficult. It also assists us to pay our elders and our healers because a lot of our elders also still live in deep poverty. And it also allows us to have the supplies that we need for workshops, for our cultural workshops, access to traditional medicines, things like the supplies for drum making and rattle making and medicine pouches. And I never underestimate the power of these items because it was through these workshops, most of which I've attended in the United Church, that I have begun to learn my own language, that I've become reconnected with my culture, and that I've been able to pass on to my children and now my two grandchildren, whether believed I'm a grandmother or not. <laughs> and I saw through my own story where 
I was apprehended, my first daughter was apprehended, and her first child was apprehended, the pain, the intergenerational trauma can cause in the cycle that we're caught in. But when our last grandson was almost apprehended this May, we were able to step in with the assistance of an Indigenous midwife, and with the knowledge that our family had around the child welfare system and around our traditional ceremonies to not only stop that apprehension, but to keep the baby in our family with his mother, to support her, to give her the cultural supports that she needed to be the best parent that she can be. And in many ways, we feel like we finally have broken that cycle. And one of the things that helped us to do that was the drum. And so when our daughter was in labor at the Toronto Birth Center, our 10-year-old daughter was also there and she helped us to drum throughout her entire labor. It calmed her down. We continued on to the hospital dealing with child welfare and we got to take the drums and for five days we sat in the, in the hospital room and drummed to the baby and drummed to our daughter. And I think that it gave us a sense of connection to each other, a sense of calm, but also a sense of connection to the creator and also the community who has supported us. And so I'd like to ask my partner, Jess, to come up. Uh, and the two of us are going to offer a drum song, um, a song that we learned in the community on drums that we have access to because of the United Church of Canada. And it's the celebration song. And we want to offer it because it's exciting to us to be able to celebrate the healing that's taking place and the healing that we know will be able to take place as a result of the contributions to Gifts with Vision. And so before we offer the song, I'd like to say Chimigwech, thank you for the United Church's continued support. It's exciting work that we're engaging in. It's exciting to have this opportunity, I think, to support the healing in our community and the healing of generations to come. At our circle last month, one of the young women sat around and she said, I don't want our children to sit here three generations from now having to have a healing circle because what's happening is still happening. And so when our cultures are strong, when our families are strong, and when our children are strong, we're stronger as a community. So thank you. see you, those kind of big events where you're offering leadership or advising the moderator or helping plan for general counsel. And then somebody will mention to me, oh, I was just at this beautiful funeral for a street person that didn't have a church. It was this wonderful minister, Evan, that, that gave it. Or we hear, as we have today, about the circle that you're offering for people whose needs are so real 
and so unrecognized in so many times and places. And you've recognized them, and you've stepped in and made a circle and, and brought something on behalf of our church that the world needs. So thank you so much for what you're doing. Giving Tuesday, uh, how appropriate to have you here with all that you give and any bit that we can give to support that work. We're so grateful. And now, Ruth, uh, back to you. So this year, um, I was asked to do a prayer for Giving Tuesday, um, and I happily said yes um, to it, and um, my starting place was grace. My starting place is always grace, because uh, it's God's grace that gets me through many situations. I mean, how many of us have not said when somebody else is pulled over for speeding, there for the grace of God go I? I know I've said it many times. But grace, uh, U2 is one of my favorite bands, and they have this song, Grace, and there's a great line in it, grace, she carries the world on her hip. And I kind of think that's what Giving Tuesday is about. It's carrying the world and caring for the world. So I'm going to share with you the, uh, the prayer I wrote for Giving Tuesday. Uh, Lydia helped me to form it and, and make it absolutely beautiful. Uh, she took my words and transformed them in beautiful ways that I couldn't. So this is a, a, a collaborative effort between Lydia and I. So Lydia... So let us pray together. Oh God, the season of waiting has begun. We wait with gratitude for the gift of love at Christmas. As we strive to find gifts to express our appreciation for those who make our world and lives better, may our gifts have more meaning. May our gifts share your vision of love in the world. Giving Tuesday is our opportunity look beyond the sale flyers and promotional emails and see a new way forward, a way of healing and connection. We live in a world of consuming, a world where the person with the most toys wins. And yet, you offer us a way filled with grace. On this Giving Tuesday, help us to give freely from the heart. We pray that our gifts will bring hope to the lost peace to the hungry, love to the lonely, and joy everlasting, a way where each of us has a piece of your heart to share with others, a way where we do not win until we give, and in giving our hearts are filled. O oh God, may we be able to joyfully share with many our gifts with the vision of a better tomorrow, knowing that when we do so, we become like the magi of old offering our gifts to the refugee child, the child living on the margins, the child born in a, Beth in a stable in Bethlehem. Amen. So thank you for being here today. Thank you for how you make a difference through your gifts. As Matt said, give, give, give. It is Giving Tuesday. So I encourage you to go to the giftswithvision.ca website and uh, do your your Christmas gift shopping is coming up it's not far away um, it's less than a month away so get out there and get your gifts um, and giving Tuesday and we have some uh, treats for you there are gifts with vision branded uh, cupcakes uh, thank you Dee for creating the brand and Kathy for getting the cupcakes and having the vision of the cupcakes and there's also Fruits and cheese and crackers and there's coffee made and the kettle has now been fixed. So let us eat together and share together in this time together. Thank you.